live but kicking we're recording nice, I'm hopefully nice. in hd now and like 4k because i just got a new webcam uh, oh. i'm looking good and i got the got the brandon right here as well so like beautiful yeah i noticed um, that <laughs> moving up in the world yeah man we are indeed so all right let's get into it let's get into it so thanks again ash for, for joining me you're going to be a regular now i feel like i've locked you in now with like a contract <laughs> so you can't go anywhere let's um, do it and, and today we're talking about how you perform well in role so you know fortunate enough that we've and uh, you know our community lots of people are getting jobs now and um yeah it kind of just dawned on me that we need to we need to start sharing some some nuggets of how to perform well when you actually get your job you know this is really important now and just to set the scene i hear so often that people are kind of really worrying that maybe they're not doing so well or you know they're in a new team and suddenly it's not like university and you've kind of got to um sort of deliver but as part of a team not just by yourself so it's sort of adapting to that you know experience and that corporate lifestyle and the reason i think this is going to be a really important episode and, and why i want everyone to listen and watch all the way through is because ultimately what we want to do is, is give you some tricks and tools to perform well in your graduate scheme and your placement in your internship in your entry level role so that by the end of that you can get offered a full-time position and or get pay rises and get promotions which is ultimately going to be important for the bottom line so um yeah ash i've got a few few points uh, a few ideas um yeah do you want to do you want to share anything though off the top before i get into those i suppose with myself like i the reason i do a lot of the stuff i do is because number one around especially around university time i felt as though there wasn't a lot of support um around careers and what you can do beyond university especially in the in the degree i chose as well so i was a bit lost after university because i didn't want to pursue what i did my degree in which was law so i kind of just fell into different roles and was kind of just going through my career a bit haphazardly so this is why i really enjoyed these sort of conversations and i think it was even only until kind of later on in my career where i actually started to think about these things proactively as well so when I used to start a job, I've not had that many jobs in all, in all fairness, but I probably had three or four main jobs in my career to date. And I never thought, OK, I'm about to start this job. Let me structure the way I'm going to approach it. Who do I need to speak to? What do I need to do? What my, What is my plan going to be? I kind of just went into it and just went with the flow. So now with the benefit of hindsight and realizing things I did well, things I did not so well, um, I think people will really benefit from this conversation. So it's a, it's a topic I, uh, I I'm hopefully we're going to enjoy talking about. 100%. Let's let's get into it. I'm looking looking to learn something from you as well. So the first thing I've got in my list is um, so day one or week one. What I think is really important to do is to put time in with each member of your call your core team. And when I say put time in, because that's like a corporate corporate word that you don't use before you get in. Uh, to your first job essentially just send someone a calendar in, invite for 15 20 minutes for like just a catch up um could be a coffee if you're a coffee drinker i don't like coffee to be honest i feel like it messes with my, <laughs> with my sleep i don't drink it at all but um you can just get a water or whatever um and just put in put in 15 minutes to catch up with them and the the general premise is um, i'm new to the team i'd love to hear more about you and what you do in your job and the, the types of things you've accomplished in your career. And everyone likes uh, talking about themselves. And I would say most people are really keen to help young people and especially new people who've just joined the team. And so I think this is really important to do with your core team, but also other departments, other teams that you'd be interested in moving into. And I think it's helpful for quite a few reasons. I think firstly, just from a getting comfortable from like a social sort of standpoint, I think it's easier to feel comfortable once you've had a few chats with everyone first, like individually. So, you know, when there's kind of jokes going around or people are just chatting, it's just easier for you to chime in rather than like sitting in silence, you know, for the first week. Mm. So I think it just gets you a bit more comfortable. And then I think the other piece is when you're actually doing your job, a big part of performing well, I think, in the corporate world basically comes down to how good are you at getting someone else to to help you out or do something? So like, can you go to the marketing department or can you go to the PR department and get them to, I don't know, put in a good word with the talent that you work with or, you know, get a bit more out of the budget and that sort of thing. So essentially it all comes down to relationships mm. and it's just going to be way easier for you to go and ask someone for something 
like that once you've already put some time in and asked about them first rather than just trying to take away something straight mm. from the off. you know what I'm saying it comes down to like just the principles of networking itself like when you're approaching someone maybe you haven't spoken to before if the first thing you do is asking them for a job or asking them for an interview it's probably not going to go so well so you want to lay those foundations you want to build those relationships at first have kind of no massive agenda you literally just want to get to know people you're working with and i mean to your point i think it's really important to get be proactive with this especially if you're in a remote role or people are still working from home in the business you're about to join because firsthand seeing other people join the business i work for i've i've seen it's a real struggle for them to build those relationships remotely i'm not saying it's impossible but it's definitely a lot harder through video calls and like if the only time you're interacting with some people in your wider team is on a group video call you can't have those one-to-one interactions like you normally would in the office where you you might just bump into someone in the kitchen or you see someone working by themselves you might go say hello and introduce yourself it's a lot harder to do that virtually so i think it's important to be really intentional um it would really help if your manager would be proactive with this sort of thing as well your manager should be initiating these short conversations for you but if they don't then i think you should take the initiative um and like you said once you once you're in a role and you need something or you need someone's help on something, then you need to know who to speak to. And once you've had a lot of those conversations, there's always that one person in every company who you ask them something and they'll be able to find the right person for you. Or they'll have like someone who they're really good friends with and they'll be able to pull, pull strings for you. So you need to find who that person is and, and get them on side essentially from day one. So I think those initial kind of virtual coffees or in-person coffees or whatever it may be, are super super important so yeah definitely agree with you on that one yeah i think that's a, that's a great point yeah you got to find the plug haven't you to you know get you connected with everyone and, and hopefully yeah it's a good point actually go to your manager first of all and say you know who do you think i should be chatting to or can you make the intro just to make it a bit easier um but i guess yeah and then dive in dive in yourself as well and i just also think for and this is probably not ideal, but a lot of a lot of what happens with promotions and job offers and that sort of thing is down to like how much people like you and how much you get on with people, especially internally. You know, like if you you really want to move into, um, I don't know, you really want to move into the account management team and you put in some time with the account director, like even a year before you finish your graduate scheme, let's say. And, you know, you have a good chat and you both love traveling, you get on really well, you know, there's a, there's a much better chance he's going to send you an email and go, oh, look, there's a, there's a role in my team that's available for mm-hmm. after your scheme. I'd love to have a chat with you. That's kind of how these things work. Yeah. Um, so I want to, you know, that's a good way to start. Yeah, that that's a tough one because as much as like, because, okay, so when that those sort of things happen, it leaves the door open to discrimination in the workplace and not it and things not being fair for everybody or everybody to apply for certain roles but at the same time you need to accept the reality of the situation whereas that these sort of things will happen and you will see it and as bad as it is to say as as inclusive as a business wants to be it's very hard to escape those situations um so you do want to essentially play the game a little bit and you need to understand the way things work and understand that if you do want to get into this other team over there, you need to start having conversations with that team and the people who lead that team and things like that. So I think it's a really important point. And uh, one other thing that, that just came to mind as well, when you're having a lot of these conversations, something that a lot of people forget to do is actually work on their intro pitch. There's been a lot of times where I've been in meetings and someone's had to introduce themselves because they first started and they've literally just said, hi, I'm so-and-so, I am the new HR business partner or whatever it may be. And it's kind of like, is that all you have to say? Mm, <laughs> it's yeah, like, ha- have, have, have a little 30 seconds. I'm so-and-so, I'm here in the HR team. I've done this before. And maybe have like a fun fact or something like that something to to break the ice a little bit and if you're having a lot of these conversations all the time you're just going to be saying the same thing over and over again to to different people obviously so i think it's important just to have that intro pitch um to warm people up to you i think is is majorly important because the last thing you want is just like a really bland hi my name is this i do this and then there's nothing after that and people kind of don't know don't know where to take it from there 
yeah yeah you don't want to come across as boring so yeah <laughs> have that have that elevator pitch ready i remember um, what i remember what, one, one of the <laughs> one of the roles i had a few a few years ago now the uh so i knew a few of the people in this company and they told me i don't know why i'm telling this story but they told me everyone when they join this business they have to write a poem and stand up in front of the whole business and say the poem to everyone and i was like what and everyone literally was was in on the joke and i stood up i said it and then the whole <laughs> business started cracking up and i was like what are you lot laughing at and they were like no one has ever done this before <laughs> so <laughs> so no look way. out for them as well yeah that, that, that's i want to hear your poem at the end of this episode Folks, i'll see if i can find it it's end. probably in my notes somewhere <laughs> all right the, ne the next one i've got is is bring solutions so um I, I was on the bt sport graduate scheme and um i think i, I think i was the best basically i'm put it out there i think i think i was the best in the whole of the bt scheme to be honest um but i'm just backing myself right I'm now sure you are. One, i'm sure you are. one one of the pieces of feedback i kept getting that my manager really appreciated was rather than bringing a problem i was bringing the solutions to the table. So what happens is when you're when you're in an early career role or even an entry level position early on in the process, you know, first few months, oftentimes you're not going to get a ton of decision making authority. You, you're not, you're not going to be able to sort of make the really big calls like right early on in, in the job role. It might be a bit different you know, later on in your career, but when you first get into the job, you know, you're going to have to run things by other people. You're not going to just be able to be pulling triggers left, right and center with big marketing budgets and big spend and that sort of thing. So often when a problem exists, you're going to have to go through your manager anyway. And what I think people struggle to understand is like your manager has got a whole job that they need to do. So they're really focused on that and they're, they are worried about you and what you're doing, but they're worried about themselves probably first and foremost, right? So what they don't love and no one loves is tons of just problems being thrown at them. So what, what makes their life easier is saying, oh, there's this problem that's arrived. This thing has gone wrong. And by the way, things will go, there will be problems constantly, right? I like to think if there were no problems, then you wouldn't have the job. Like your job is to essentially solve problems in, in, a, in a sense. So when you bring a problem to the table to your manager, also say, oh, and guess what? This is what I would recommend we should do about it. Or I've already spoken to so-and-so and they've suggested we can go this route to deal with that issue. So it's kind of like lots of other people around you might just be bringing the problem to the table and say, oh, I don't know what to do about this. And then they get put on the spot with the manager goes, well, what do you think? Whereas what you need to do is say, look, this is the problem and this is the solution that I've come up with and I've spoken to so-and-so about it already. What do you think? Yeah, no, 100%. And I think it comes down to understanding, like, what you need to remember. And I think this might not apply so much to entry-level positions, but not, not what you're saying, but what, what I'm about to say, but more so to experience. But I think it can also be attributed to entry-level positions as well, is that you got to remember the people you're working with, they may have been working for this business for a number of months, a number of years, and they're used to doing things the way they're, they're doing things. And it's super useful for a new person to come in, look at the processes they have in place from a, a fresh set of eyes, from a fresh perspective, and be able to suggest those changes. Because like when you're quite tunnel vision in your role and you've been working in a role for quite a while, sometimes it's hard to see alternative ways of doing things. So people will really, really value those suggestions and and it comes down to how how many times on a job description do you see things like champions process improvement or something like that that's exactly what that is it's looking at the way a, a business does certain things and certain processes and improving those and making suggestions and i think sometimes some people and, and to another point if you can't find a solution at least show you've tried if there's a problem you have to hand and you really don't know what the solution is and you really need some help or some direction come to your manager and say i've uh, this is the problem this has been my working around this is my brainstorming i thought about this but i don't think it's going to work because of this at least you've shown some kind of initiative to your manager and you've shown that you're not like you said not just coming with a problem but you've tried to solve the problem even if you can't do it that will give your manager a lot of kind of a lot to work with and help you build on from there and hopefully help you to find the solution so i think is a is a really important one
Mm. And, and what's kind of related to this and, and part of the reason why I want to do this episode is because I felt that I, I just felt looking back, I kind of probably worried more than I should have about how well I was doing in the job, you know, at the beginning. And I'm hearing this so much now from the young professionals I'm talking to, they're getting into these jobs and they're sort of thinking, you don't get that constant feedback loop of how you're doing. And so I don't know if this is a normal, what well, the psychology here is, but we kind of assume we're not doing as well as we think we are, especially if it's like the first corporate job you've had, right? You've got literally no reference point. So one thing looking back, I realized like, you know what, I actually was doing much better than I thought. And I, I think a lot of people put pressure on themselves in the beginning and, and sort of think there's something going wrong or, you know, that they're not adding enough value. This is what I hear a lot of. They're like, the team around me have all got 10 years experience in sales and I've just walked in through the door, you know, how can I contribute? How can I bring ideas when, you know, they, they kind of have that imposter syndrome because of yeah. things around them. But to your point, one of the reasons why we, you know, companies do hire, at, you know, entry level and, and junior employees and younger people as well is because you can bring that fresh perspective. Like they want you to come in and, and give a new angle on what they're doing and give fresh ideas and that sort of thing. So I don't know. I hope that helps people just understand that it is very, very normal to like worry that you're not doing well. And I would pretty much, I think you can kind of assume, maybe you can't assume, but I always felt like you're doing a little bit better than you probably think you are. I don't know if that if that resonates with you as well. And you know what? It's a really good point because like a lot of businesses, because the transition from university or a course, like you said, you're in in education, you're constantly getting that feedback loop where you know how you did an essay, you know how you did an exam, and you and you understand you're constantly improving. Whereas in the workplace, some places there isn't that massive like feedback culture. So if you if you're not in a in a workplace that doesn't have that if you're in a workplace that doesn't have that feedback culture then you probably need to go out of your way to get that feedback and it, it, it reminds me of a time with the business uh one of the business i've worked for so i'd started and there was a particular stakeholder that i always thought was really kind of cold and wasn't i thought didn't like me or, or didn't like the work I was doing. Um, and when it came around to doing feedback for me, I asked that person to give me feedback. And I was really nervous when I opened it. And I opened it and it was literally glowing feedback. So you never know, like certain people's personas or just the way they carry themselves may not be indicative of the way they think your work is so just be wary of that and like you said I think you can mostly assume you're doing better than what you are but I think asking for that feedback continuously um if you're if you're working on kind of shorter projects at the end of each project ask for feedback maybe set up a google form if your business doesn't have the processes in place like the business I work for we've got we've got software where we can request feedback from whoever we want in the business, they fill it out, it gets sent to you, it gets sent to your manager and things like that. If you if you don't have that, you can create that yourself. Create a Google form or just have some set questions you can ask people, send it to, send it to them at the end of a project, ask your manager two, three, four times a year, however often you want. Be proactive about it and then you can constantly get that feedback loop. And then number one, it will help you to, probably help you to overcome imposter syndrome to a certain amount because what you'll probably find is you're actually doing really well um, and your, the expectations you have of yourself are probably too high uh, and number two if there are gaps if there are room for improvement you can identify those early on and work on them and continue to grow yeah that, that's a classic one isn't it when you've got like a more senior member of the business who's maybe a bit introverted maybe just a bit quiet and a bit short and sharp and you and you maybe you're extrovert yourself and you're like this person absolutely hates me you know but it's just we're all walking around with our own sort of silo but you know that person's busy this thing could have gone wrong or it's just their personality right and that's how to communicate so you know don't take it personally if that's the case um next one i've got is is widening your remit so my other my other tactic was to with every i think graduate rotation i had there were these basic tasks that were included on the job description which is like these are the things you need to do as part of the job 
right and that i call those like grad tasks yeah so you know you've got no 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 disrespect to any of these tasks but more so you know administrative things or reporting or um you know scheduling or, or just you know lots of planning things that sort of thing so those are the fundamental things that need to get done for that that role in the job org for you to fit into the big vehicle and, and do your part and so what i try to do is find out ways and to be really efficient and sort of build any systems that I can to get those tasks done efficiently to free up time. And that allowed me to sort of go to a manager and say, uh, look, I'd love to, you know, I know I'm leaving to go into another rotation in six months. Before I do so, I'd love to get involved in that project or I'd love to lead on something if, if there's anything I could lead on. And then they go, you know what, Ooh, Toby's really proactive and he's getting his, his tasks done, he's getting his grad tasks done, so that's good. Let's give him another project to let's throw another project at him because that's going to make us look good because we can talk about the great things Toby's doing and our team is going to be doing even more. So it's kind of like get rid of those tasks sort of efficiently if you can, free up some time and then work on some cool stuff. And I think bear in mind when we're looking for those promotions or the salary negotiations or whatever further down the line, we're going to be referencing this this more sort of cool stuff that, you know, the, that is outside the core role because if if it is outside the core role then the other grads on the scheme might not be able to talk about it so that's the thing something i and just an example you know i worked on the the bt support app and we actually do a lot of the analytics and sort of um yeah present how we're doing and and all that kind of thing and i wanted to take it a step further so it's like i want a project that i can own and I ended up sort of building, you know, working with the developers. They do all the hard work, not me, but <laughs> they built, you know, tools so that you can give feedback in the app. And, you know, then that led to me building an app on the Apple TV because I did that bit well. So then it's just a snowball effect and suddenly your CV is looking much better than it probably should do. Well, maybe not much better than it should do. Then like you're you're selling yourself and you're you're deserving of those accolades. So it's it's uh, it's certainly a big thing. And I think you've hit the nail on the head with like once you've done the requirements on the job description, what you're doing is you're fulfilling the job role. So when it comes to negotiating a salary increase or a promotion, it's kind of like you have to be doing more than what's on the job description to justify those salary increases and those promotions. Because to a certain extent, you have to be playing, if you want a promotion, you have to be playing the next role to somewhat of a level to justify that promotion. Because otherwise you're just performing your job role. So why why are you deserving of a promotion? So you need to understand, like for example, I was managing people before I became an official manager or before I was paid to be a manager. So you have to play that job or you have to upskill yourself to get to that level. But I think it's, I think it's definitely important. I think you have to, it just makes your job job more in, uh, interesting as well, right? If you're not just doing the, the day-to-day roles on the job description and you're going beyond that and you're understanding um, what processes can be improved and how you can change we do how we do certain things or work on an employer branding project or whatever it may be something really interesting and ideally something that is going to last and you can say I did that and even when I'm not here the team or the company are still going to be using this thing to generate x amount of revenue x amount of gp and it will really help you going forward into promotions or into other roles and things like that so i think taking on those extra responsibilities without kind of burning yourself out and taking mm-hmm. on too much mm-hmm. there, there's always a balancing act with, with all of these things i think we're talking about definitely definitely now i think that's a that's a really good point and i think a lot of people just assume you're you're just going to be deserving of a pay rise or a promotion after a set period of time but you know you need to earn it and you if you have metrics and you're recording you, these numbers that that really helps back up you know your your claims or, or your your sort of pitch to get a pay rise or promotion uh, the next one is a bit of a funny one that i found over time which was like you might as well whenever you get a new task you might as well just take it on confidently so i sort of found that you basically don't get the choice of whether you do the task or not. <laughs> so there's sometimes it was like, oh, I'm not sure. What if this happens? What if I can't do this, that and the other? I, you know, be a bit sort of timid about it. That's how I was in the beginning. I was like, I'm not sure if I can do that or if so-and-so will, will be on board. And your manager d- could not care less. <laughs> They're like, this thing he's doing and yeah. uh, we need you to do it. So after a while, I was like, you know what? 
anything you get on your table, you might just be like, yeah, cool, I can do it. Be really, really confident about it, you know, and just sort of, um, and then you sort of almost speak it into existence, right? Because you're confident about it. You tell you, your manager you can get it done and you, you're telling yourself you can get it done. I just found that helps the impression of you internally because then they just sort of worry about you a little bit less and they start to think of you as that that person that just gets stuff done and you know just backs themselves and does it confidently and then like we say if a problem arises you're gonna mm. suggest us to bring that to your manager anyway so yeah absolutely and again it's a balancing act right because you don't want to be that person that would just say yes to everything and then you end up doing all the the tasks no one wants to do just because you say yes to everything so it, it is certainly a balancing act so you need to understand when to say no when to know if people maybe are taking advantage and giving you too much work versus other people in the team and things like that and it's a tough one right because everyone always thinks they've got the most work on so <laughs> you need to understand mm. how much you have on how much other people have on and how you can divvy up the tasks as it were but i think your point is approach each task each project with confidence and if you approach and i've done this before in the past when you approach it with timidity uh, and you and it, it just you can, other people can see it on you and like as bad as it is to say they just won't take you seriously uh, and they won't if you're not taking if, if it looks like you're not taking this project seriously why should anyone else take this project seriously so it's uh it's not something that comes naturally to a lot of people and it is certainly something that a lot of people do need to work on but there are ways you can do this uh, and I, I suppose the more me personally the way I grow in these sort of environments is that I just push myself into the deep end and I just do it and I just kind of firm my way through it not everyone likes to do it that way but for me that's what I find works so it's all about finding your way to overcome these these aspects I suppose for sure for sure you're doing a really good job of balancing me out here because you know I go for the extreme <laughs> you you're, you're making a balanced you know more safer argument that's what I need so I'll stick with my my uh my role here which I'm, which I'm happy with so and then uh, so last one I've got on here and it's, it's kind of related, but um, ad adding value to the, the team um, with with extra things. So, you know, if you're really sociable, it's like organize, being the person that organizes in the social events or, you know, get togethers. And it's like it's the one who's suggesting we go somewhere after work and and coordinate that. I've, I've got a friend who I used to work with who was absolutely amazing at this. And the boss used to absolutely love her because she she was put showing initiative. It was like extra stuff. It was always a way for her to people knew about her, right? Because she's going and building connections. And I, I'm not so much like that, but I was I looked at her. I thought, you know, it's incredible that you're you're able to do that. And if that's not your personality, there might be other things, right? We we had um, a couple of people on, uh, or at least one that's live already from Google. And what they love uh, is they have this thing where. 80% of how you're sort of assessed is on your your core role and then another 20% is just the extra things that you decide to do and they try and allow you to carve out time to do that so if you're passionate about diversity and inclusion maybe you can start a program or just be part of what they've got already um, or it could be socials it could be volunteering and setting up volunteering days for the team so those extra things that are yeah get you in front of people and allow you to build up more connections I think really helps as well yeah no totally 100 percent. i think i'm a bit like you i don't really like doing the whole social side of things and organizing that sort of thing but i've got a, a woman in my team and she's amazing at that sort of stuff um and it's like yeah take that on board run with it and like you said you become like the popular person and people will, will kind of like be attracted to you and really kind of um hold you in high esteem so i think it's really important and if it's not something if, if you're not interested in the social side of things, find something else that you're interested in. Like you said, like at um, MVF, the business I work for, we've got our different networks. So we've got our LEAP network, which is the lived experience of ethnic people. We've got our LGBTQ plus network. We've got our women's network. And now we're in the process of creating a neurodiversity network. So there's so many different aspects you can just contribute to. You don't necessarily have to lead on them or be the main person, but if you just want to get involved in them, then that, these are great things you can just talk about. And like you said, build your network internally. And I think are, 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 is definitely a great shout and probably something that I didn't do too much of early on in my career uh, and certainly something now I'm trying to do more of. And you, you, you definitely reap the benefits and you become someone in the business that the business doesn't want to lose 
because everyone likes those people who do those extra things, who set up clubs, who get involved in networks, who do these sort of things. So this may help you with when it comes to negotiating salaries. And if you were to get an offer from another business, this may cause your business to counter offer you and really show show you that they that they value you and want to keep you in the business. Whereas if you're someone who tends to not get involved, wants to come in, just do their kind of day to day, their nine to five. I'm not saying you should work more than nine to five, but if you literally just want to do the basics, then you may not be as valuable to the business. So I think it's I think it's a great shot, and I think it's really important that, that what you just mentioned. Yeah, and you you mentioned value there, like everyone's kind of you can almost think of a business that's like they're going to kind of attribute value to people in terms of what you bring in and if it's sales it's going to be really tangible and then they're going to take away your you know your salary from that and that's like what you bring to the table and you know all of these extra things are just adding them more and more of that value uh, in their in their eyes and that's going to really help with the with the salary negotiation so uh, yeah th- those are my points those are the the things I had lined up um is there anything like that So there's a couple of things um, that do come to mind and some things that maybe myself as a manager, I've made the mistake of in the past. That I think is really important from the managerial side, but also from the person who starts in is understanding what your learning style is as a person. Um, are you a reflector? Are you an activist? And these are terms we can go into a little bit more later, but th- these will help you to learn your role from the get go, especially if your first role out of university. So, for example, um, I'm, I'm a reflector personally. So what I like to do is take in all the information, digest it. So I'm someone who always reads the instructions before putting together IKEA furniture and stuff like that. I will never go all the way in. I'll make sure I've got all the pieces and all that sort of stuff. The opposite. I cannot follow any of those instructions. I just start doing stuff and there's bits left over. You know? yeah, there you go. So this is a perfect, perfect example. If you and I were to start the same role at the same time, and then we had the same manager and the manager taught us in a way that said, here you go, here's a project, run off and do it you'd probably really enjoy that. And you can get stuck here and make mistakes, um, iterate and things like that. Whereas I'd be lost. I'd be like, what is going on here? Like you haven't given me any structure. You haven't given me any direction. I need more information. Like what what do I need to do? So you'd be to such a, a certain extent set up for success and I wouldn't be. So that doesn't mean the other person is any better suited to that role. It just means you haven't been given the training in the right way. So it's, and when I joined MVF, we did a really cool exercise um, with our chief people officer in the first week. And it's part of the onboarding process for MVF. Uh, and what she made us do was to get into teams. And if I remember correctly, it's called like the marshmallow challenge or something. And she gave us like string, spaghetti, marshmallows, and we had to build the tallest structure possible. And she was just walking around the room observing us. And then at the end of it, she didn't tell us why we were doing this. And at the end of it, she'd tell us all exactly what our learning styles were. So she'd observe and she'd see me standing back, reading the instructions, looking at all the pieces. And then you have other people like literally just grabbing the things, putting it together the, and, and getting involved. So it's understanding this. And like I said, I've made this mistake in the past where I've kind of I may have given someone like the the university or the school way of doing it where you're just a teacher and you're saying here you go this is this is everything you need to know da 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 and the person in front of me is just like glazed over not interested in what I'm saying and has maybe struggled or hasn't been the best start to their career so I think understanding your learning style communicating that to your manager and so they can help set you up for success um I think is a really important one is any thoughts on that or no, I, I like that one a lot. I'm, I'm big on, I think another chat we could have could be a bit more of a deep dive on that. And I think, I think personality types can impact learning. And I think that can impact, generally speaking, what jobs you might be suited to. Uh, I think there's a lot of different personality types in different job roles. But in, I think there's a broad sort of chat we could have in the future that would be really interesting around that, which might sort of help people feel more comfortable and think, oh, I'm a bit like Ash and I, I kind of learn this way. And because of that, maybe there's other there's certain types of jobs or just ways of structuring your tasks and your routine that's going to be better for you. So, um, yeah, I like that one. What else you got for me? Yeah, definitely. Another one that comes to mind is if you're someone who works a role where you're going to have lots of different stakeholders in the business, you need to understand how they want to be communicated to. 
So again, this is a mistake I've made before in the past where I've, uh, so I do recruitment, so I've taken a job brief and I'm just cracking on with the role. And the nature of recruitment is it may be a bit quiet at first in terms of interviews and making progress with actual job search, but that's because you're doing a lot of the legwork beforehand. So it will get like a week after the job brief or two weeks after the job brief, I'm doing the work, I'm screening candidates, I'm advertising jobs, I'm headhunting, but I haven't told the hiring manager I'm doing that. And then after a week, a week and a half, they're like, Ash, what's going on? I haven't heard from you. Like, And I'm like, I've done all the work, but they don't know I've done the work. So it's understanding, does, does this particular stakeholder, do they want um, bi-weekly updates? Do they want weekly updates? Can you set up a Slack channel and give them daily updates if needed? Or are they someone who only wants to hear from you once you've got five interviews for them? So again it, there's no silver bullet there's no one right answer to this the right answer is how your stakeholder wants to be worked with so it's asking that question the first time you speak to them or first time you're engaging in a project with them and working that forward and and proceeding from there i think is a really important one that some people tend to forget brilliant i think that's that's next episode you know we flip it we'll do you know what we what we did wrong and I think what, what people, <laughs> what other people get wrong, because I've got, I've got an even longer list for that as well. So um, yeah, well, let's share that on the next episode. I've, I've done a lot of things wrong, so <laughs> that, that might be a long, a long episode. <laughs> there you go, there you go. You can learn from us, everyone. So yeah, actually, I think let's wrap it up there. Let's save some uh, material for next week. Um, I've certainly enjoyed that one. Uh, make sure you subscribe, everyone. Like, review. Thanks so much for listening to the end. Drop a comment. And uh, check out Ash's channel as well. I'll link to it in the show notes. And uh, yeah, we'll see you. We'll see you next week. Make sure everyone you comment say good, how good Ash is. So he makes sure he <laughs> keeps coming back. Um, so yeah, do that for me. Yeah, thanks so much, Ash. Really appreciate it. Nice one, Toby. Speak to you soon. Cool. All right, let's see you there.